you. Hi, my name is KHOU. Um, a big question and concern for parents right now is the current condition of the schools. Um, I know we found out today that at least two campuses have mold. I know um, we got a statement from the district saying that there's remediation work being done and that there's tests being done, but how can you ensure uh, parents that those campuses and all campuses will be ready for Monday and what exactly is being done to address the mold issue? Yeah, those, I, I believe those two campuses have already been remediated uh, as of today. Uh, what's been done over the summer has been incredible work from our maintenance folks. There's, uh, you know, we went through derecho and there was, you know, trees on some of our buildings and a lot of debris. So we, we got the, the classrooms and schools ready in just a few days. Uh, we finished school and then, you know, hurricane. Uh, and that also caused a lot, some damage to our buildings and a lot of debris, knocked out some air conditioning units. Um, you know, put us back with regard to grounds maintenance, both the derecho and the hurricane. And then we had two weeks of rain. Uh, I think it's one of the wettest Julys in, in Houston history. Now, part of that's because of the hurricane. But in any case, uh, I haven't been here long, but I know that when it rains in the summer, the grass grows fast. And so um, it put us behind on, on cutting the grass at 274 campuses and another 20 other buildings that we have to maintain. So uh, all along during the summer, we've been looking at, we've been fixing air conditioning units, we've been move, removing trees, removing debris, and all of that. And we feel pretty confident at this point that all 274 campuses will be open for school on Monday. Uh, we're, we're still a little bit behind on grass. It's all, I mean, people forget quickly how much rain there was. It's only been dry weather for a week and a half, um, almost two weeks now. Um, and you know, that there's, a, there's a lot of grounds to maintain. So uh, we'll be ready. We, we have, there's a, a handful of buildings that may not have the grass cut by that time, but we, we're pretty confident that the overwhelming majority will. I just wanted to ask what two campuses were uh, the ones with the mold, and you said they've been remediated as of today. Does that mean that there is no longer any mold at those two campuses? That's correct. Hold on a second. Why don't you take it first? Audrey, I wanted to ask, you know, we heard from a lot of community members who urged you and the rest of the board not to vote for a bond. Can you talk about why you voted in favor of it? Sure. I mean, um, I, I know you've probably been at, at our, our two meetings that we've held where we've been able to ask a lot of really good questions about about the bond and how it's structured. Um, I think for me personally, as a parent in the district, um, and looking at it from, a, as, from the aspect of being a board member, um, really looked at it closely, understood that the work had been done by the Community Advisory Committee even before we started looking at it um, in our meetings, although it has been discussed for quite some time. Um, and I think it comes down to making sure that our kids have a safe and healthy environment in which to, to learn. Um, our schools, the facts are that our schools have a lot of work that's necessary um, to bring them up to a standard that we would all expect for our kids. And so I think from, from that standpoint, we really just had to look at it, um, for me personally, um, at what do I want for my kids and what, what would I like to see in a school? And um, the facts are that we have some schools that need significant work. And so for that reason, I, I voted in favor of it. Can I answer the, the question over here? Uh, Love Elementary School and Cashmere Gardens Elementary School. The mold that was found has been remediated, so those, those schools are, are ready to go. Does go without it? I'm not sure. Audrey, was there any consideration uh, to, to amend any part of the bond proposal, whether it be the CTE centers or the, or the co locations? And obviously, there's no changes made to the proposal, but was there any real consideration given to making any changes for the vote? So you saw all the de deliberations in open meetings in front of the full community by the full board, and that's the only way that we can act. The, um, the discussion by the community advisory committee and the memo that they prepared for the board was fully considered by the board members, as I'm sure you've, you saw um, through multiple questions by the board, um, both in meetings and outside of meetings. So there's a whole question and answer process that we undertook 
um, to understand better the reasoning behind the CTE centers, what's expected there, and, and what the forecast is for those particular centers. I think one of the important things to, to remember um, and for the community to remember in the CTE centers in particular is the amount of input that the community is going to have in the future. And one of the items that was discussed by the CAC um, and recommendations from the CAC was to have a advisory group um, specifically tasked with looking at the CCMR in the district, and that is something that the district and the administration have agreed to do, and we're looking forward to that. Um, among all the trust issues, one of the ones I've heard most recently is that you're fixing up some of the schools to put them in better shape so that you can then sell them for more money. I have no expectation that that's in any plan. Uh, not true. So at the last count, we had 47 vacancies uh, for all teacher positions, 47 out of 10,700 teachers, teaching positions. So we, we call that, you know, a really good uh, sign that we'll be able to start school and it won't impact kids negatively. Um, the positions that are, are left are uh, the ones with uh, um, certification. So, for example, I think 16 of those positions or 12 of those positions are uh, special ed. We have 1,380 some special ed teaching positions in this district. So we only have 12 or so left to fill. A uh, couple of them are ROTC positions. A couple of them are career tech ed positions. Those are very you know, specialized uh, positions, so hard to find. Um, replacements. Uh, all total, though, um, we turned down a whole bunch of teachers uh, in every job fair, uh, either because they didn't have the the, the right specification or um, they weren't uh, they didn't meet our proficiency bar. So I I think we're looking at a good year with uh, starting the school year off, school year off with very few vacancies, if any, we'll see, um, and uh, um, just. A higher, uh, high, if highly effective teachers in, in our classrooms. Uh, just to follow up on the question that Maria asked, we're hearing from some parents who say that they've been asked to volunteer at their kids' schools this weekend to get them ready for the first day of school. Is that happening across the district, and is that needed in order to actually have all the campuses ready for Monday? So we have our maintenance crews, you know, working hard. And again, when you get behind and and cutting grass and at a school um, it's it's hard to it's hard to catch up uh, in just a short amount of time and really we only had about two weeks since the since the hurricane that to, to really cut our grass well so I think some schools are taking it upon themselves to say hey you know just like uh, many other schools out there uh, that are uh, that operate uh, they ask their parents or they ask their teachers or their staff uh, to join in. Um, I, I've done that before myself uh, when I was a principal, when I was a, uh, a superintendent in a different district to say, hey, um, let's do a beautification project, let's rake some leaves or anything else to get ready for school. So if they're being asked to volunteer, it's, I, I'm glad that they're being asked to volunteer. That's okay. And that's, a, that's something the community can do to come together to support the schools. I think this year, somewhere around 850 uh, uncertified teachers were hired, um, so that they'll start this year. They have to enter a, um, a program to get certification over two years, so that's happening. And many of those are teacher apprentices uh, that were, uh, were moved from teacher apprentice to the classroom. 
those teacher apprentices have bachelor's degree. They've worked well this, this year. And so they transition into the classroom. They also will have to get their certification. Um, in the in the last year, there were some <coughs> complaints about the the our, the the teach the volunteers brought. Well, they weren't volunteers. The after school uh, people who were brought in that maybe they weren't really competent uh, to teach whatever courses that they were brought in to teach. Is there going to be any more? Was that just left up to the individual principals? Uh, is there any, going to be any more rigor applied? Any more checking applied to see if somebody really knows what they're doing before they get to get with these kids? Are you talking about after school? The, yes. So a if it's an after school activity, uh, in most cases it's up to the principal to have the after school activity or not. Uh, we actually don't have a, uh, guidelines for NES schools to have act after school activities unless the principal wants it. Okay. And so, and non NES two have the have the autonomy to do after school activities the w the way they want to. I'm sorry, I probably I did misspeak. I'm talking about the kind of classes that you bring in, so that you have arts, so that you have, and some of the people seem, didn't seem to. There were reports that they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, I, I believe you're talking about dyad program yeah. then. So the dyad programs are on top of electives. Uh, just so to remind everybody, it's uh, two. Um, classes a week on in addition to electives that the NES students take um, in martial arts photography their extra experiences uh, gardening right. cosmetology any number of things uh, based on the community and based on what the school wants and so we have dyad coordinators that help draw them in they are um, consulting uh, uh, consultants who come in, they get paid on 1099, so they're not employees. And yes, some of them, um, we find out as they're, you know, they may not be as effective in teaching photography, so they will be, uh, you know, not hired, hired after we, we try them out for a while. And uh, this year, the same thing, we'll try to get people who are skilled in their job. And remember, I mean, there were hundreds of them, and the overwhelming majority of them uh, did well with our kids and and had the skills that we thought they would have so a photography person who does has their own business in photography or the is a is a person a good example of somebody who came in and did a good job with our kids um, cosmetology person who has their own business in cosmetology um, someone excellent in teaching our kids so in overwhelming majority of cases I would say they did a good job and in some we had to remove them Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak. I'll give you the broad brush uh, strokes. So um, it's we have uh, uh, the ability to um, raise or borrow money through a bond, and we have the ability based on our assessed value and what we've paid down over the years on any borrowed money. And so because we haven't had uh, uh, any bond in 12 years, that capacity to borrow money off of the assessed values that we get all the time um, allows us to do so without raising taxes. Um, so that's a general picture of it. And uh, before I get into any trouble, I'll defer any further answer to uh, the finance department. Um, and so there's about at the end of the school year in June we had 2,770 2, teacher um, vacancies or people that we had to hire and so 
of that number, you're talking about somewhere around 850 of them are new teachers. And do you have any estimate on the number of those that were previously working in HISD as teacher apprentices versus just um, new folks in the district? Okay, so I'll give you a number, but every time I give you a number, you hold me to it and you say, well, that's wrong, you lied about that. Um, <laughs> So if you want a general number, I can give you a general number. If you don't, you know, uh, there's lots of different numbers running around. If, I, if you want, I'll just send you the number. I mean, if you have a number, I'll take it. If not, you don't have to say it. Like, okay, for the rest of you, too. I'll send you a number. <laughs> <laughs> My other question um, was last year when school started, there were a number of um, campuses that had uh, AC uh, issues that maintenance had to come address. Uh, I think it was maybe around half the district, or I don't get the numbers wrong. There's dozens of campuses. Um, this year, it's we have two more weeks of school in August. So August heat. Um, does the district plan for that to be a problem again? How's it preparing? Yes, we plan for it to be a problem every day for the next several years. You know, every day for the next several years in August and September, maybe part of October, and then again in April and May. Um, just like last year, we have challenges, and so we will, we will, we're working hard to, to fix all of our systems, um, but it's, it's a challenge. And so we have temporary coolers, we've bought more temporary coolers, uh, so we're going to continue to, to work on air conditioning when it's hot. Yeah. I want to talk about the, what the district is going to do, if anything, to work on building trust with people as this election comes up, and what opportunities people will have to provide their input on some of the proposals in the bond before the vote. Could you talk a little bit about that? I can if you. Sure, yeah. sure. So I think um, at, at our last meeting, there was a pretty robust discussion about how the community can become involved. Obviously, the um, the board voted this evening to allow that the bond go onto the ballot. The voters still have to vote, right? And so we look to the voters to, to decide for themselves about this, um, this bond. But um, assuming um, that it goes forward, there will be a lot of opportunities, as described by the administration, um, for folks to be involved both at a campus level and then with regard to the CCMR programming uh, that were expected and have been described um, for us in our meetings um, at pretty great length and I think also in some community meetings that have been held across the district. Uh, so it's my expectation as a board member really in general with regard to, to, to many things that are going on in the district that the community will have input into them and this is one of them. A couple follow-up questions uh, on that one. I'm putting the spot here. If, if the election were held tomorrow, do you think Houston voters would support or not? And if not, what would have to happen between now and November to, to get them to support? So I don't think I can answer that question. Um, I think it's a question that we've now p uh, allowed as a board to go forward to the voters so that they can decide whether or not uh, they support the bond. Obviously, the board has, has elected to go forward and allow that to be placed on the ballot so that the voters can make that decision for themselves. Well, just for clarity, I know you guys have said that you don't plan to raise taxes uh, as part of the bond, but reading the actual language on the proposition, if people voted for it, they would, based on the way it's worded, they, they would technically give you the authority to raise taxes, right? You want to take that? Um, just factually, uh, we don't have to raise taxes uh, to, to pay for a bond. But, but that's what the language of the proposition is potentially allowed, right? You know. uh, I'm not sure what the question is, so I, I, I won't res respond to that. Um, so the, the the bond that has uh, that has been passed, or the the proposal, is is framed the way it is, because we haven't had a bond election in 12 years, 
And so what that meant for the, for the community to consider, the community advisory committee and the board, is that unlike a typical bond where you build buildings, and mostly just buildings and the, the ones that are um, the most affected, we had to think about health and safety uh, issues across a wide number of schools. And so that's why, it, that's the main reason it looks the way it does. Margaret? Uh, going back to what uh, Asher said about the heat, Center Point has said it's going to help us by taking uh, with power outages across the area of four to eight hours. Have you been in contact with Center Point, and what are you going to do with if it hits the school? Uh, again, the first part with about, about Center Point. The heat and everything. Center Point has said it's going to uh, so that they can fix our our grid. What they do, They're, it's going to mean everyone in the area is going to lose power on different days for four to eight hours. Have you talked to Center Point about this to try to schedule it on the day that school is in session, or have you talked to them at all about this? Yeah, our deputy chief has been in contact with Center Point quite a bit over the summer. And I suspect that she will uh, also talk to them about this. Um, and by the way, there, I, I just need to say that we've been in touch with uh, several organizations and, and leaders. And so uh, over the summer, Commissioner Briones, Commissioner Garcia, and Councilwoman Shabazz, uh, they've all helped us and partnered with us and provided uh, a conduit for, uh, so that the the city can help us uh, maintain the campuses, clean up some of the debris, and recover from uh, Hurricane Barrel. If if follow up, if a school loses power for four to eight hours, will the camp classes be canceled there for that day? Yes. Yeah, so you, you yes is the answer, but you know that we try to do all everything we can to keep our kids in school even if that means moving them to a school that has power. Um, but we'll make those decisions uh, that make sense so that we're not, you know, jerking kids around. Um, but at the same time, you know, every day counts for our kids, and so we'll do what we can. Uh, I think we did a good job after Derecho to try to get the schools back up, and after, the, after Barrel, same thing. I mean, we didn't, we didn't wait to remove trees and get, try to get the buildings back up. So. We'll do everything we can to keep the schools open. I want to talk again about the grass. Um, our people have been attributing this uncut grass to cuts to the maintenance and custodial departments. I was curious if you could talk one about the nature of those cuts, how many people are cut, and if that is in fact impacting the scheduling for maintaining the campuses and cutting the grass. We look very closely at um, our service level agreements. How how long does it take one team to cut X amount of acres of grass? And uh, to be honest, we haven't been able to, to analyze any change in staffing because of the, the weather. Um, I mean, seriously, I, you know, if, if, you, if we were here just two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, uh, I probably wouldn't be getting these questions because the, the answer would be obvious, right? It's like. They haven't been able to cut the grass for two weeks, guys. Come on. And then before that, there was a hurricane. So uh, let's, let's wait to answer your question until we've had time to analyze, actually, what's, what's going on. The other thing, uh, there's a difference between a service level agreement to cut grass that's not really high and then to cut grass that's wet and really high or just really high, tall grass. And so. Uh, all of those things have to be figured out before we can answer that question definitively. But in the end of the day, we will have the maintenance, the grounds maintenance teams that we need to maintain our properties. Um, yeah, I think that's the second part of that question. Um, uh, were custodians asked to reapply to their positions for fewer hours? Are they are custodians working fewer hours from 40 to 30? Could you speak to, could you speak to that? Um, first of all, what about those achievement scores, guys? <laughs> <laughs> the, mo the most important thing that was talked about tonight was accountability and why reform works. Uh, 121 DNF campuses down to 41. But I'll answer the question about grass 
anyway, and about custodians. The custodians, no, um, custodians, we still have custodians. We had the, uh, the number of custodians we think we need to service our schools well. Uh, we'll see because school starts on Monday, um, but we're pretty confident that we have building managers who are actually uh, getting a higher salary and, and receive some training for that. And so we think that schools will be serviced well. Um, if we need overtime, we'll do, we'll do overtime, um, but we haven't started yet, so we'll analyze that too at the appropriate time. I, would like to ask, I, know. <laughs> I have a question. I think I, I, I would welcome a question about the accountability ratings. Could I ask a different question? I think question he would too. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk in recent meetings, and it's an accusatory what is your legacy? What is your legacy? Meaning the board of managers and here, that you're, What do you think your legacy is? Because when they say that, it doesn't sound good. So, what do you think your legacy is? I said when we um, when we got seated in these positions that people could judge us by the results that we got mm -hmm. and by our actions. And I think the accountability ratings um, show that what Superintendent Miles and his staff and the teachers and the students in this district th this year are are nothing short of remarkable. And so I'm okay with my legacy at this point. I feel comfortable. Um, that we are making changes that are impacting our students in a positive way and at the end of the day we're talking about our kids the kids of our city and we want to make sure that they are getting the education that they need and i feel like we're making progress and it, that is exactly what's shown by those accountability ratings i can ask a question yes, hey. um <laughs> you said yesterday and again today that the district had several schools that jumped from and F to A, which is the biggest jump of the school cap. How is that possible? What what happened there? That's a huge jump. Yeah, no, it's only a handful, so let's keep that in perspective. We have 274 schools, right? So, um, but it is a huge jump. There's 20 schools that went from an F to a B, which is also a huge jump. I mean, just going up a letter grade is significant. Um, and once you see how that works across the state, it puts it in some, it'll put it in some perspective. But the reason why the jump is what it is, is the things I talked about tonight on why transformation works. Uh, we focus on the instructional model. The, the instructional model works. NES instructional model, differentiated instruction combined with direct instruction at grade level with scaffold works. And I use those phrases intentionally because that's really hard to do in our profession. At grade level with scaffold. The uh, high quality instructional materials, the curriculum. F for all the, the initial uh, complaints, um, it worked. It was embraced by teachers. Teachers actually liked it. I said that back in September because I've been in the schools and I knew that they were following it. They liked the curriculum and you talked to them. And it just got better over the year, and now it's even better. Um, the the uh, focus on instruction, that's huge. And if you talk to other leaders of schools and districts, a focus of, on instruction is hard to do. You have to actually get the whole system to do it, and you have to have principals in the classrooms. You have to have teachers used to it. You have to get good instructional feedback, et cetera. The growth of the staff capacity. That's important. Um, growing our, both our teachers, our principals, and our executive directors, to, to be honest. Uh, the leadership growth, not just principals, but executive directors, teacher leaders. We focused a lot on principals and principal training. That made a difference. And then finally, while it caused the most angst and maybe the most um, you know, adult pushback, the high performance culture Yes, we're going we're gonna to expose our own selves. We're going to hold ourselves accountable. So yes, you're, we're going to go into your classroom. It, it, was the, the, it, it was that sort of thing, that culture and those other things I just talked about that caused the, the high growth. And in some schools, they did it in spades, right? They implemented so well, uh, they got the growth. And to a footnote that I, I think people will appreciate, 
is that uh, for some schools there was low hanging fruit and they were they were behind so far and they had not done even basic things like align the curriculum to the standards that when we did that that uh, that automatically would have gotten them a, a letter grade uh, higher so all you know it's a pretty complex thing every school is a little bit different but that's the answer why they got the growth they did one last question Margaret. this will be a less happy one sure. <laughs> <laughs> in the past in HISD, as in other districts, when there was such a tremendous increase, the TEA came, usually came in and examined erasures on tests and other things. Was, did the TEA take, take any sort of closer look at, at the remarkable turnaround at some of these schools? I, I can't speak for TEA. I, I suspect they followed practice that they've always followed. Um, but l let me say this. The, the mere fact that kids did well is not uh, evidence that, some, that there's a problem with their success. 